Hey y'all, I'm Tracy. Welcome back to Just Dig It Farms. I have had so much fun spending these Sunday afternoons with y'all together in the garden and just sharing with you some of my favorite herbs this year. Today will be our last video for season one, Sunday afternoons in the garden. And I thought it would be great to end our season with a recap of my top 10 favorite herbs for 2020 and how I've used them. We've had 10 episodes this season of my top 10 favorite herbs for 2020. And I've went in depth in each episode about a lot of information of each individual herb. We've talked about history, we've talked about folklore, we've talked about all the benefits of it, we've talked about how to grow it in your garden, um, we've talked about the benefits of growing it in your garden, we've talked about medicinal uses and culinary uses and just a wide range of information about these individual herbs. So if you've missed any of the episodes of this season, I'm gonna put a playlist above, a link to the playlist above, and you can go back and catch up and watch all of those different episodes because I think you will find some very useful information in each video about these different herbs. This is American elderberry or Sambucus nigra. It's native throughout the United States and it grows well in zones three all the way to zone 10. It grows very, very well for us here in Alabama and we find it a lot of times in ditches on the side of the road and all in the wood edge. It's very prolific and grows a lot here. The elderberry and the elderflower are both very, very high in medicinal properties. We like to harvest a few of these elder flowers when they begin blooming and opening up. This is the end of May, so about mid-May they really get started good opening up. But we like to harvest some of these and make elder flower tea, which is good for allergies, hay fever, cough. Uh, it helps bring down a fever. Um, it's a good diuretic and it's a calming tea. So we like to make elderflower tea with the flowers. There's a lot of great uses for the elderflowers, a lot of great medicinal uses and benefits for the elderflowers. You can make um, elderflower cordial, elderflower champagne, jams, jellies, wines. Um, you can make elderflower fritters, teas. Uh, there's all different kinds of things you can make with the elderflowers as, as you can with the elderberries. This is the makings of a delicious cup of tea. My herbal tea blend, which has elderflower, borage, lavender, yarrow, lemon balm, lemon verbena, and a little bit of chamomile. Honey straight from the hive. I'm gonna use a couple of drops of lemon oil and a couple of drops of ginger oil. Elderberry is very high in health boosting compounds such as anthocyanin. Anthocyanin is what gives these berries their dark purple black color. There's dozens of different species of elderberries, but the Nigra subspecies canadensis is that has the highest concentration of the health boosting compounds. Plus it produces the best tasting fruit but I love having the elderberries in the orchard. I love using them as a companion plant to benefit my fruit trees and benefit us because we really use these elderberries and elderflowers for our medicine.
elderberries are grown for their elderflowers and their elderberries and they have been grown for thousands of years and used medicinally. Hippocrates was one of the first people to ever use elderberries. He even wrote a book about it. He believed that he could cure any ailment or heal any ailment with elderberries. Elderberries are one of the highest antioxidants on earth and it's an anti-inflammatory so it's used to treat inflammation problems. It's high in vitamin A, B6, and C. In fact, one tablespoon of elderberry juice is 80% of the vitamin C that you need daily. It helps with sinus infections, it helps to fight colds and to flus and viruses. It's even being tested in Alzheimer patients and being found very effective. One tablespoon a day really helps you keep healthy. It's not only great for the vitamin C requirement really that your body needs a day, but it's also very, very helpful in moving free radicals out of your system and inflammation out of your body. I make elderberry cough syrup and elderberry tincture every year for us to definitely take throughout the winter time when cold and flu season starts kicking in gear. We start with taking our elderberry cough syrup and it doesn't last as long as elderberry tincture. You can make a tincture and it can last probably indefinitely, but the cough syrup doesn't last as long. It lasts maybe a couple of months or so. So whenever we finish up with our elderberry cough syrup, then we start taking the elderberry tincture. So I dehydrated these on about a hundred. It was right around a hundred degrees and it took about two days. So you can see all these elderberries here. That's a good many. Of course it takes, takes a good many to make your recipes, but um, I'm still got to go through and sort and get these green ones out the best I can and get all these little stems and stuff out of here the best that I can. And I've still got a lot more to work on here. But that right there is just good medicine. I don't have time today to make up my elderberry syrup and my elderberry tincture, but I made a video at this time last year and just showed you how to do it. So if you guys haven't seen that video, go check it out and you can see how I make my elderberry syrup and my elderberry tincture. This is borage or Barago officinalis is the botanical name for it. It's also known as star flower because you can see the little flower is shaped like a star. And it's also known as the bee plant or bee bread. And it's usually just buzzing, buzzing, buzzing with all kinds of different bees. Bumblebees, honeybees, little native bees. Everybody likes this. This is a favorite of the honeybees. Borage has a lot of medicinal and culinary uses. Most of the plant, most of the parts of this plant are edible. You can eat the seeds, you can eat the flowers, you can eat dried stems, you can eat the leaves. Most of the plant's edible but the leaf is definitely edible and it definitely has a lot of great properties in it. So you could pick it and dry it and use it in your teas or um, use it to make salves and, and infused oils and different creams and stuff. Now the flower, which is my favorite part of the plant, the flower can be tossed in salads. It can be dried to use in teas, wines, jams, jellies. You can candy these and use them on uh, desserts or muffins or treats. You can, um, freeze these in ice cubes and toss them in some lemonade or water just gives a little added flavor to it you can throw you can toss this in soups there's just you can use this little flower in everything now i'm going to harvest a few flowers and some leaves so that we can use them today this is calendula Calendula officinalis, or it's also commonly known as pot marigold. And 
it is in the aster or daisy family. Calendula has a lot of great uses, a lot of great edible and medicinal uses. The leaves and the flowers both have antibacterial, antifungal, antimicrobial, and antiviral properties. Calendula leaves and flowers are very soothing. Um, you can use them both for all kinds of different skin problems, skin issues. Um, it's a hypoallergenic and it's found a lot in different skin products. There's a lot of different ways that you can get calendula into your diet or different ways that you can use it. You can dry the flowers and make a tea. You can make a salve. You can make a compress, a poultice. You can infuse, make an infused oil. There's a lot of different ways you can use calendula. Calendula flowers and leaves are both edible. Um, I'm not gonna eat the leaves. I don't like them. I don't like that sticky substance and they're real bitter. I don't eat the leaves. I use the leaves and the flowers to make a salve, but I don't eat the leaves. But you can take the flowers and dry them and you can like adorn a top of a quiche with them, which is very lovely, very pretty to have little flower petals sprinkled on a quiche. You can definitely do that. You can make teas out of it. But what I'm mostly gonna use calendula for is just to make a salve out of it. I'm gonna make a healing salve for skin problems like eczema and rashes and stings and skin issues. I'm gonna just take these flowers that I harvested and dehydrate them. And I'm gonna take a few of them and press them and let them dry out for the journal. But for the most of them, I'm going to dehydrate them for the little sap that we're gonna be making. Let's talk about all the medicinal uses of lavender. My goodness, there's a reason why it's called the queen of herbs. It has a lot of different vitamins and minerals in it. And lavender has quite often been used for relaxation, uplifting the spirits. It's helpful with anxiety and depression. It's got so many things I can't remember everything. I have to get my book here. It's a good pain reliever. It helps with sore muscles, respiratory issues like sinus, bronchitis, uh, cold, flu. Um, it helps to eliminate the body of mucus, so that's really helpful with that. Um, it helps with all kinds of skin issues like acne, burns, insect bites, improves sleep, aids in insomnia, headache relief, sinus, tension, migraines, helps with motion sickness, helps blood to circulate in your body, good for skin and hair growth, um, uplifts your spirits, cell regenerating, wound repairing, calming, soothing, relaxing. Let's talk about all the culinary uses of lavender. You can make an herbal salad dressing, a vinaigrette, garnish your salads with uh, lavender blooms. It makes them really pretty. Just use just a little bit though. You don't need much. And of course you can make a seasoning with a lavender called Herbe de Provence, which is the flavor of France. You can add lavenders to soups, to vegetables, to desserts and pastries, the, le the blooms and the leaves you can add. I showed you guys when we talked about borage, how I put borage in my ice cubes. You can put lavender blooms in your ice cubes and do that. Um, lavender lemonade, lavender sugar cookies. When the boys were little, I used to make lavender sugar cookies for them all the time. Make tea blends, and that's one thing that I do with like my little, I keep my little lavender blooms in this old bottle that she dried, and you can just make up a little lavender tea with this and add some honey to it. You can crystallize the lavender blooms and add them on top of pastries, on top of cakes. 
garnish ice cream with lavender. You can make lavender spritzers. There's so many different things you can do with lavender. It, it's great medicinally, it's great culinary, it's wonderful in the garden. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a certified herbalist, I'm not a pharmacist. I'm just a gardener and a designer who is very passionate about plants and gardening and plant medicine and I do a lot of self-study and a lot of self-research. And my videos are just strictly to give you inspiration, encouragement, and a little bit of knowledge about each individual plant. But I advise you to please do your own research and your own study more in depth before you incorporate any of these herbs or anything that we've suggested in any of our videos. And if you have any ongoing medical issues or problems and you're taking medication for anything, please consult your physician before you do any of these things that we suggest. Echinacea is also known as coneflower and it's the immune boosting herb. Everybody knows echinacea from, because it builds your immunity system. I'm sure a lot of you, whenever you feel a cold or something coming on, you'll go to the drugstore or whatever and get an echinacea supplement and take it. But today I'm going to show you how you can grow your own beautiful echinacea in the garden and harvest it and make your own medicine with it. You can use the flower, the leaves, the root, and the seeds of this plant. Now the root and the seed has the most medicinal properties in it, but the flower and the leaves have, have some medicinal qualities too. So you can actually use this whole plant. Um, you can harvest fresh flowers and leaves and make like an herbal tea with it. Um, it has like an earthy taste and it has a little tingling sensation to it. Um, so you can make an herbal tea out of it or you can dry the petals and leaves and you can use the roots and seeds for um, future use if you dry them. What I'm going to make with this echinacea is a whole plant tincture. So I'm going to use the whole parts of this plant, the flower, leaves, roots, and seeds. But I'm going to have to harvest at different times because the roots and the seeds aren't going to be ready to harvest until this fall. But right now, the flowers and the leaves are ready to harvest. my echinacea tincture that's been steeping for a little over two months now. It's the echinacea leaves, flowers, and seeds. It's been steeping in vodka and it's almost time for me to strain this off and turn it into my immune boosting tincture. This mullein plant is just so striking and interesting. I mean it's got a neat texture to the leaf. Uh, form and texture and structure and it's just very very striking here in the herb garden. The root was more of the common part of the plant that was used in the past but now it's more common to use the leaves and the flowers. So every part pretty much of this plant can be used. The root, the, the old leaves, the new leaves, the stem, the flowers, Every part of the plant can be used medicinally. It all has great medicinal properties in it. So I'm gonna be harvesting the leaf and the flower today. Pollen is most commonly used for the lungs. It's used to help treat bronchitis, lung infections, mucus in the lungs. So it's a good herb for people who smoke too much. It helps to clean and clear the lungs of mucus. In fact, it's recorded in history of the Native Americans 
smoking mullen after they smoked too much out of their peace pipe. Then they would smoke mullen to help clear their lungs. So mullen's been used a lot in history. It's, it's recorded of Hippocrates using it and a lot of the great early herbalists use a mullen for different uh, uses, but mostly for treating the lungs. So I'm gonna try to harvest as many of these flowers as I can get, and I'm gonna make up my mullen oil with some of them to add to my calendula oil, which I'm making for skin issues, for rashes and gardener's hands and skin issues. But I'm also gonna take some of these flowers and some of the leaves I'm gonna dehydrate them and use them to make a mullen tea to help clear the lungs when we have bronchitis or uh, this, this winter when you've got congestion in your chest or whatever. See how great and long these leaves are? But what I'm gonna do when I dry them, you can see this, um, the rib going down the middle of the mullein leaf. And from what I understand, this does not dry very well. Like it doesn't really get all the moisture out of it very well when you dehydrate it. So I'm going to peel my leaf off of this rib like this and then discard that. And then I'm just gonna put these in the dehydrator and dry them or hang dry them. I don't know which way I'm gonna do it yet. And then crush them up. And that'll be what I use to make my tea. You can just take this and put it on a baby's bottom. You could like make a diaper out of it, put it on a baby's bottom. And it's really good for diaper rash. It's used a lot for any kind of skin irritations. A lot. Even like hemorrhoids, you can use it for hemorrhoids. So what I've read in my Rosemary Gladstar book is you can make a poultice with these leaves. So what you wanna do is take your leaves and get them off of that rib. Of course, I guess you could use the rib too to make a compress, but these leaves are, would be better. And then just macerate it or break it up. It just means breaking it up and I like to do that with all of my herbs. I don't think it's recommended for everything, but I like to do that in any of my herbs that I'm using because I think that's what releases those essential oils and that medicine in it when you macerate it or break it up. So you break this up, soak it in some hot water and vinegar for like, I can't remember how long she says, but just soak it in some hot water and vinegar, probably for an hour or so, and then, um, make you a compress out of it for skin irritations or hemorrhoids or um, diaper rash or anything like that you can make a poultice with this but that's one of the reasons why i'm going to add this to that calendula oil that i'm making because it's really good for skin irritations and problems so i think this will make a great addition to that oil that i'm making this is yarrow achelia millifolium my yarrow plant's kind of sad looking right now, but still deserves to be talked about. Yarrow is a wonderful medicinal plant that has been used for thousands of years. As a lot of our other herbs that we've talked about, this one has been used all throughout history. I'm just gonna harvest a few of these leaves because I don't have a whole lot out here right now. And some of these flowers. All different kinds of yarrow. The yarrow that has the highest medicinal properties in it is the old wild yarrow. The white and light pink varieties of yarrow is the, um, the highest has the highest medicinal properties in it, Achillea mellifolium. And, um, but there's all different kinds of yarrow. There's, um, there's one called moonshine and it is a bright yellow and the foliage on it's real silvery. It's really a pretty yarrow. There's paprika, which is more of a red. 
there's all different kinds of yarrow and different colors that you can add to your garden. And if you're if you're growing it as a garden companion for like to attract your pollinators and as a ground cover and as a nutrient accumulator, you know, you can grow any of the varieties of yarrow. And actually you can use any of the varieties of the yarrow medicinally, but those other cultivars are not going to have as high of medicinal properties in them as the, um, the wild white and pink yarrow, which is what I have right here. So yarrow has been used for centuries all throughout history as a medicinal, powerful plant. Um, one of the most common uses, I believe, for yarrow is to stop bleeding. And that's what they used it for in the Civil War, to stop the bleeding of wounds. So it stops internal and external bleeding. And um, that's what I'm going to do with this. I'm going to dehydrate the leaves of this and then I'm going to just crush it up into a really fine powder and I'm going to save it and just use it if there's a bleed like if we have a wound or a nosebleed or anything like that you just take that powder and put it on that wound or just put a little bit in your nose and it just immediately stops that bleeding. So it's great for that. It's great to help heal wounds and stop the bleeding. It's good for cramps. It's good for like uh, muscle pain, muscle cramps and spasms. You can make a tea out of this. And that's also what I'm gonna do with this. I'm gonna take the flowers and the leaves and dry them and use some of the leaves separately and make it like a really fine powder just to help with healing wounds and stopping bleeds. And I'm gonna make up some tea to drink. So yarrow has a lot of wonderful medicinal benefits and it's a great one, I think, to have in my medicinal herb cabinet. Hey guys, if you're enjoying this video or if you enjoyed our season one Sunday afternoons in the garden together, please like this video. And if you have not yet, please go over and subscribe to our channel so that you can be a part of this awesome community that we're developing here of like-minded people. People who are passionate about gardening and sustainable farming and farm animals and nature and God. An amazing community is developing here on this channel and I'm so excited about it and I would love for you guys if you have not yet to go subscribe and be a part of this with us. When using roses for medicinal purposes or to make your own beauty products or skincare treatments or things like that then you want to choose roses that are really really high in fragrance so like your damask roses are your old wild roses, the old, old fashioned roses that are gonna be super high in fragrance are the ones that you wanna choose. And also ones that make big, nice rose hips for that vitamin C. This is one of my medicinal roses. This is Katie Road Pink. Um, here's a pretty little flower. As you can see, I have not deadheaded this rose. Usually what I try to do is deadhead the roses after each flush of blooms so that they'll keep blooming up until fall. And then when it has that last nice fall show, I'll leave it and let rose hips develop on it. You can see some developing right here. That's a big nice one. This is one of the reasons why I've chose Katie Road Pink to go in my medicinal garden. It's because she makes these beautiful big rose hips high in vitamin C. I'm getting ready to make my elderberry cough syrup and I'm gonna add these rose hips to it. This is another one of my roses that I've chosen for the medicinal herb garden. Basie's Blueberry is the name of this one and it makes nice rose hips and it has this uh, single petaled open center bloom as well for the honeybees that love it. And I've been leaving this one too. I haven't deadheaded any of the roses in my medicinal herb garden here because I am trying to get these rose hips a little earlier. This one's gonna be loaded in rose hips. Look here, look at all these. 
here, and there, there. Plus they're really pretty. And this rose is Hansa. This is a Ragosa. And it makes nice rose hips too. It's also single petaled, open centered. This one just, the foliage on this just has this cool texture too. There's some rose hips. So primarily, that's why I'm growing these. I'm growing, I chose uh, Rosa Ragosa Hansa, Basie's Blueberry. Uh, right down there, I didn't even show you that one, but that's Old Blush. It makes rose hips. It makes a lot of rose hips. They're just smaller. And then at the end down there by the mullen was Katie Road Pink. As we come around to the front border of the Potage Garden, this little rose is called Maggie. And Maggie is high in fragrance. I'm gonna go ahead and harvest these. I'm just gonna pinch them off right here. And dry these flower petals. It makes great tea, beauty products. There's a lot of wonderful medicinal uses for these rose petals. This is my healing salve oil that I've been working on making for quite a while, since June. I've been working on this. It's of avocado oil, and I've added calendula, comfrey, borage, rose petals, lavender, and mullein to this. And it's just been steeping all this time. I'm gonna make a salve with this, but I'm gonna use my beeswax from our bees. And I haven't rendered my wax yet, so I'm not ready to make that. But I've actually been using this oil just like it is. I ran out of night cream, so I had my oil steeping. And I decided I would just use it because it's avocado oil and it's got all these wonderful herbs in it. So what I did is I just took a few drops of it like this, put it on my hand, and I've got frankincense essential oil which I already use on my face. It's really good for wrinkles and sunspots and age spots and things like that. This is, this is a really good essential oils for that. So I use this every night anyway, and usually what I do is just take it and put it on my wrinkle spots or my sunspots and then put my night cream over it. But what I decided to do since I was out of night cream is I just took this oil, put it on my hand, Put a few drops of my frankincense on there, rubbed it together, and then just put it all over my face. And I liked it so much that I've just been continuing to keep using it. I really love it. This avocado oil with these herbs in it just really moisturizes your skin. But I'm going to take this and turn this into a great salve with my beeswax for rashes and stings and... Um, eczema and different skin issues. But I think I'm gonna save out some of this oil and keep using it too as my night cream. Talking about Camellia sinensis, the tea plant. And I have a little bit of surprise for you guys. We're gonna go visit my friend Rosica and she's going to give us a little bit of a tour of her nursery. And her husband Silvano is going to show us how to make tea from the tea plant. It's the camellia that is used to make all of our tea, to make white tea, oolong tea, black tea, orange pico tea. It's, it's used to make all tea. The leaves of the camellia sinensis tea plant is what's used to make all different kinds of teas. It's just about in the harvesting and the processing how you get the different teas. I am so excited to be here today with Silvano and Rosica and they are graciously taking me inside their kitchen today and they're gonna show us how to make tea from the Camellia sinensis tea plant. I'm super excited. Like this, you see the like this? Yeah, and you see these small tender ones? This is where the pico tea comes from. So you've heard of orange pico tea. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason it's called orange is because the, it's, this is Camellia asamica ruticae and ruticae is orange. And so it's related to the orange and the camellia. And so the smallest leaf, the bud leaf, is where the orange 
pico tea comes from. Okay. Same plant. Yeah. It's not a special plant, but it's the leaf. And you notice how Rasika is picking the smaller leaves. Uh huh. We don't want big ones. When they get that big, they're it's very bitter. But we want them small. Like this one right here. Okay. Here is the tea that we just, this would be the tea we picked after about three days of drying. Haven't done anything to it, just let it dry in the sun in the window. And to make the tea, I don't even want to touch it. I keep it inside and just mash it. And open it back up. little bit more and so basically what we've got is the foundation for green tea put boiling hot water and let it steep okay how long do you let it steep I let it steep for about three minutes okay until it starts getting that golden color to it. And I'm just gonna strain it. That's very fresh. It's a little bit hot. Mm, that's good. I harvested a few leaves off of my Camellia sinensis tea plant and brought them in and washed them, let them dry really good, and then I put them in this brown paper bag and I just folded it up and I put it in my window seal. It's a south facing window where it gets a lot of the good hot afternoon sun. And I just put this in that window seal and I let it dry for, it's actually been there for probably two weeks, but it, it wouldn't have took that long. It probably would have only took three days, three or four days or so. But this is my results. Got all these wonderful dried tea leaves. And I'm gonna do what Silvano suggested. I'm just gonna take them in this bag and I'm gonna crush them up. And I already have a few that I did that he gave me from their camellia tree. I'm just going to add these to it. Oh yeah. So now I've got some dried leaves ready to make some green tea with. And I'm just going to keep harvesting as it shoots out new, fresh, green growth. I'm just going to keep harvesting and try to collect up a jar full of these wonderful tea leaves so that I can have tea throughout the winter. Just be my green tea foundation, my base foundation for my green tea. And I'm just going to add different herbal blends to that tea, like my lemongrass or the elderflower tea blend that I made or if I need yarrow tea, or if I need mullein tea for the bronchitis or whatever, for the lungs. Whatever herbs that I feel like I need or that I want to incorporate into my diet that week for whatever reason, then this will just be my base for my green tea and I'll add my herbal blends to it. So I'm gonna try to keep harvesting this and collecting up a full jar of these wonderful green tea leaves. This is Moringa, or also known as the Tree of Life or the Miracle Tree. Moringa is an ultimate superfood. It's super, super high in antioxidants and vitamins and nutrients. In fact, it is really used effectively in third world countries to combat malnutrition. 
They use it a lot in Africa and Ethiopia and a lot of very poor poverty third world countries. That's why it's called the miracle tree or the tree of life because it is providing nutrients for uh, a lot of very poor unhealthy people. Another great thing about this plant is you can use every part of this plant edibly and medicinally. So the root, you can make a tea out of it, but it kind of has like a horseradish type flavor. You can take the trunk and like scrape the trunk. This one's not old enough yet, but you can like take and scrape the trunk and make skin products out of it. You can eat the flour that it produces or make teas from it. The seed pods can even be eaten. You can make like long seed pods and you could even cook the seed pods and eat them or you can eat them raw. The leaves is the most common part of the plant that people consume. It, it actually has the most nutrition in it. And you can just eat those fresh. You can just walk by, pick them, eat them fresh. You can put them and toss them in salad. Uh, you know, however you wanna eat them. You can eat the leaves just like you would spinach or lettuce or whatever. But you can also dry the leaves and then powder them. Grind them up and turn them into a really fine powder and add them to smoothies or oatmeal or yogurt because it's just like a superfood for green smoothies. A documentary that I watched on Moringa, the doctor on the video said that Moringa is about as close to a perfect source of nutrients as she could find. Let me just read to you some of the benefits of this Moringa plant. It is antimicrobial, antifungal, antibacterial, so it helps fight infections. And you can find these stats all over Pinterest and the internet. But it has four times more protein than eggs, three times more potassium than bananas, four times more calcium than milk, four times more vitamin A than carrots, seven times more vitamin C than citrus, four times more fiber than oats, and 25 times more iron than spinach. That is amazing. It's a great source of a leafy green vegetable protein, lots of vitamin A in the leaves. So if you are on a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet, this is a super high source of protein. It also helps your body to be able to absorb nutrients. It helps with anemia. It can help to lower your blood sugar, your cholesterol, your blood pressure. But everything that I've read says to be very careful if you're on medications for those things because it could lower it too much by taking this. To absorb iron, it helps with eye health, with kidney health, helps with asthma and allergies, uh, it helps with stomach issues and digestion issues, it helps protect the liver, protects and nourishes your skin and hair, makes your bones healthier, um, it helps with arthritis and inflammation problems, helps with depression, anxiety, fatigue, um, it helps in fight infections, and it helps with mental clarity and energy. High in vitamins, nutrients, amino acids, protein, antioxidants is just truly a superfood. So I'm gonna just strip the leaves off of these stems just so it can make me a finer powder for smoothies. I don't want to get little rough stems in my smoothies. That worked pretty good. It made a nice, fine powder. I don't have very much right here. This isn't gonna make very many smoothies for us, but like I said earlier in a video, I'm going to grow it next year. I'm gonna grow it as an annual crop and try to grow a whole bed of it so that we can preserve a lot of this moringa powder. For our smoothies. As our afternoon in the garden today comes to an end and season one Sunday afternoons in the garden comes to an end, I just want to tell you thank you. Thank you so much for joining me 
on our Sunday afternoons in the garden together. Thank you so much for joining Jean and I on our farm journey together. And I'm a little sad that our Sunday afternoons are coming to a close, but I'm also very excited because I have some ideas for the future of some different videos that I want to do that I think you guys would really enjoy. I'm planning to do season two this winter on designing an old fashioned cottage garden. And I'm going to take this fall and work on creating some awesome content for you guys for that video series. So even though I'm sad that our Sunday afternoons in the gardens coming to a close, I'm also very excited about our next season that's coming up. I would really like for you guys to give me some input on what you think about that series. If you would enjoy that, if you would like that. I also would love to know just what kind of what kind of content will you guys like to see? What are some different videos that you would like to see me create that will help you guys with some of the questions that you have, what you're wanting to learn more about as far as gardening and farming? If you enjoyed this recap of my top 10 favorite herbs for 2020 and how I use them, and you enjoyed the Sunday Afternoons in the Garden with Me series, and you probably also would love this video too about establishing my medicinal herb garden. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. God bless you, and y'all have a wonderful week.